for some Colonel exploits. All right. Last talk of the night, then drinks. Uh, welcome to my talk, Smoke and Mirrors, Driver Signatures are Optional. I'm Gabe Landau. I work at Elastic Security. So I'm a low-level Windows engineer and reverse engineer. I help build the Elastic Endpoint, which is an EDR. I spend a lot of my time detecting malware tradecraft and uh, looking at ways to attack and defend my own product against uh, adversaries, even if they have administrative privileges. Um, I've previously presented research at ShmooCon, Black Hat Asia, and Black Hat USA. Uh, while these days I wear blue mostly, my heart will always be red. So uh, we're going to start talking about Windows file sharing. And when you say Windows file sharing, people usually think about BitTorrent, LimeWire, Kazaa, if you're old enough, Napster, right? But we're actually going to be talking about how files are shared between different processes on the same system. So on Windows, when you open a file, you use the API create file typically. And that's Win32. There's kernel versions such as NT create file or ZW create file. But when you open a file, you specify the access rights that you want to that file. So if you want to write, uh, write data to the file, you'd specify file write data. If you want to read data, file read data. If you want to delete or rename the file, you specify the delete access right. Well, simultaneously, when you specify the access rights, you also specify what's known as a sharing mode. And you can think of a sharing mode as, I'm OK with others doing X to the file while I'm using it. So you might be OK with others reading the file, or writing the file, or even renaming the file. Uh, when you're opening a file, your desired access is tested against the share mode, all existing share modes, for all other current handles to that file. And simultaneously, your share mode is tested against the granted, previously granted access to all handles to that file. So if there's a, a failure in either of these tests, you'll get what's called a sharing violation, and your attempt to open the file will fail. Uh, here's a table from Microsoft on their website uh, talk, showing a bunch of different compatible, different options when you're opening a file. So there's also a concept known as exclusive access. And if you open a file and you specify a share mode of zero, then you have opened the file exclusively. And uh, according to documentation, nobody else can open the file. So sharing is actually enforced by the file system. Um, the file system can, uh, is responsible for doing multiple sharing checks. But one of the, 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 the first ones that it does is it calls into the IO manager, and it uses this function IO check link share access. And you can see here NTFS is calling this IO check link share access that does that test I just talked about with the desired access against the shared as well as the converse. So there are, besides current handles open to the file, there are other ways that files can be modified. So for example, through memory mapping. It's possible to memory map a file on Windows. The typical flow is you open the file with the ZW create file or you know, in Win32 create file. Uh, and then you receive a file handle from that, and then you call a ZW create section, which creates a section object. This is, an, this is the kernel term for a file mapping. A file mapping is a section object, same thing. So ZW create section, and then that creates a section object handle. So now you have two handles. Uh, and then you map that section, what, what is known as a view of that section, into your address space. And once that mapping is complete, you now have that the contents of that file accessible in your process memory as though it was just regular memory. Uh, the thing is, once you have this view of memory, readable, writable, it, uh, it depends on how you configured it, you can then close those handles to the file and to the section object. So now there's no open handles to the file, and yet you still potentially have a file that's writable. And so to account for this, the file system is responsible for calling this function here at the bottom, mm does file have user writable references, if the requester is expecting nobody else to be able to modify the file. The, that's what that file share write test is right there. So there's another caveat, and that is for executables. Uh, files that are mapped in memory as executables, and when I say executables, I mean exes or DLLs or .sys files. They have other extensions, OCX, CPL, et cetera. But they're all under the hood. They're PE or portable executable files. Uh, if they're mapped in memory in a special way called an executable image section, or sec image you may see, then nobody should be allowed to modify that file while it is currently mapped and in use. And so here we can see in NTFS, 
there's this uh, NTFS open attribute check function that looks to see that if the request is attempting to uh, be able to modify or write data to the file, then that request only succeeds if there are currently no active uses of that PE file uh, for an image section. Chapter two, code integrity. How do you trust the code that is running on your system? So Windows has this uh, specification called authentic, authentic code uh, that allows you to digitally sign a PE, or again, portable executable file, such as an EXE, uh, in a way that using cryptography that is crypto cryptographically verifiable, such that you know that it was issued by a particular entity, and that if the file has been changed since that initial signature, it is tamper evident. You will know because the signature will be called broken. Uh, here we can see the digital signature on NTOS kernel, and, uh, and thankfully the signature is okay. All right, so, uh, authentic, so authentic code cannot use regular hashing. And the reason why it can't use regular hashing is because if you were to stick a signature at the end of the file, you've now changed the file and therefore changed the hash, like as if you just you know, run SHA sum or whatever. So instead, there's a, a, a specification, uh, well, it's an, an algorithm uh, in the authentic code specification called authentahash that defines a special way that you're supposed to feed the data from the PE into the underlying hash algorithm in order to get this resulting authentahash. And the digital signature is actually computed over the authentahash, not the regular file hash. So uh, Windows has two main implementations for authentic code verification. Uh, one is in user mode, and that is out of scope for this talk. Uh, the other is in kernel mode, and that is called code integrity. Uh, it is a subsystem, it is implemented in CI.dll, and uh, you can't just, for example, patch your own certificate authority into CI.dll and then load uh, drivers that you've signed because CI.dll is protected by secure boot and trusted boot. They work together. So code integrity provides, you, the, the protections provided by code integrity are generally broken down into kernel mode code integrity. And this provides driver signing enforcement, uh, making, checking the signatures on, on drivers as they are loaded, as well as the vulnerable driver block list. Next is uh, user mode code, uh, code integrity, rather, uh, which this is responsible for validating the uh, signatures on EXEs and DLLs uh, as they're loaded into user mode processes. And this is used to implement things like protected processes, specifically the digital signature re requirements for protected processes. Uh, if you've enabled the Microsoft signer mitigation in your process, only Microsoft signed DLLs are allowed to load into your process. Uh, if you've enabled the integrity check, uh, check bit because you're running a FIPS cryptographic module, uh, the UMCI will uh, enforce cryptographic requirements on those modules. It's exposed to user mode as smart app control and it's exposed, uh, I'm sorry, it's exposed to consumers as smart app control and exposed to businesses as app control for business. Uh, both UMCI and KMCI, uh, they can implement different policies for different scenarios. So the protected process scenario will have different rules and different policies than the integrity check scenario, for example. So now we're going to be talking about some incorrect assumptions, some long-standing incorrect assumptions in Windows. So Microsoft documentation implies that files opened with that do not allow write sharing uh, that these files cannot be modified under you. But remember before we talked about how this, en this enforcement is done by the file system. So what if the file system doesn't know that the file has been modified? So EXEs, or executables uh, images, uh, or the, 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 the types of memory mappings, the sec image uh, that are created from PEs to run in memory, uh, they can be paged out, just like any other uh, file type of file mapping. If your system's low on memory, it can page things out. Uh, if a page belonging to an executable image has been modified since it's been brought into memory, then a private copy has been made for your process, and that is pushed out to the page file. It's a private page at that point. Uh, you can imagine if you have an EDR installed and it, and it installs a hook on some function in NTDLL, the moment it writes to that page, a private copy is going to be made, and uh, then you will the, that page would then be written to the page file at that point. Contrast that with a page that has not been modified. Uh, those pages can actually they don't have to be written to the page file because you already have a pristine copy on disk in NTDLL, right? So you can just throw the page out uh, if there's enough memory pressure. You don't need to save two copies of the same thing. So upon a page fault for such a page. 
if the page has been modified, you'll go and fetch it from the page file. But if the page has not been modified, you can go back to that original PE on disk, you know, NTDLL, for example. So uh, another concept that's important here is page hashes. And these are an optional list of hashes that allow the memory manager uh, to validate the hashes of pages during a page fault. Uh, and I'm, these are not official terms, but I'm breaking them down into two different flavors. Uh, one are static page hashes, and these are page hashes that are created as a file is signed. So when you sign a file on Windows, you'll typically use what's called sign tool, and sign tool will, uh, you, there's an optional parameter to it, slash ph, that if you specify it, it will hash all the four kilobyte pages within the, the file, and will include the hashes for all of those uh, inside the signature. Um, another type of uh, page hashes is what I'm calling dynamic page hashes. And these are uh, computed on the fly by code integrity if necessary, because maybe uh, pa page hashes are required in a certain scenario, but they were just never put in the digital signature. So this gives uh, CI some flexibility that it didn't have otherwise. There's a cost though. Page hashes aren't free. You know, if you're, if you're paging in a megabyte of data, now you have to hash a megabyte of data and you have to you know, check those uh, those hashes and validate them. So we're going to give a hypothetical example here. So let's say we have an orphanage and a ransomware operator wants to attack an orphanage, right? And so the, they, they send an email to the administrator of that orphanage and the, the administrator double clicks on the attachment and it's a Word document and they click enable macros. And they run as administrator with split token, AKA they use UAC. Uh, and there's an automatic UAC bypass right in the payload. And so now the uh, ransomware operator has code running as administrator uh, on the local system. Well, they want to get the antivirus out of the way. They want to do all of their encryption, all of their damage without the potential of uh, an AV uh, stopping them or detecting them, et cetera. So they, will try to, they might try to kill that antivirus, but antivirus runs as what's known as PPL or protected process light. And one of the features of PPL is you can't be killed even by an administrator. Um, so one thing the ransomware author might try to do is they might try to run their own code as, uh, as PPL. But the thing is UMCI, as I described before, enforces specific signing requirements uh, before allowing a particular uh, EXE or DLL to be even load within a protected process. So that would fail because they don't have the, the uh, a corresponding private keys to generate the correct digital signatures. So another thing they might attempt is they might try to open one of the EXEs or DLLs that is already running inside of a PPL on the system. Well, that's not gonna work because of the, I was talking about that MM flush image section before, the immutability of in-use executable files, that will, pre that will prevent them from tampering with already running code on the system. But there's a problem here. And the problem is that that file write data check, that immutability check, is in NTFS. What if we move the file system to another system? We could put it on a network share, use SMB, or server message block, which is the Windows uh, file share uh, protocol. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be a real system. It could be, uh, a, Samba, it could be a, a Samba server, it could be Linux. It could even be a Python script that's running impacket, which is, that just speaks the SMB network protocol. Um, so because the attacker can modify the DLL server side, bypassing the sharing uh, implementation of the file system, DLLs can be incorrectly assumed to be immutable. And I'm calling this type of vulnerability false file immutability. So we talked about page hashes before, and he said, well, great, you can modify the DLL, but won't page hashes catch it? I mean, by the, the, by the act of changing that DLL, you're gonna be changing the hashes of the contents of that DLL, and so therefore page hashes will get you. That, that's true for kernel drivers, and that is true for full protected processes, but it is not true for protected process light. PPL do not enforce page hashes most of the time. So, I disclosed last year at Black Hat Asia an exploit based on this uh, titled PPL Fault. And the general idea is that you, the attacker who is running as admin, right? This is admin to kernel, which is not a security boundary, remember? Uh, the attacker is, has a puppet 
protected process. I was using services.exe, and they are attempting to sideload a DLL into a PPL. They, you, you can't just sideload a regular uh, arbitrary DLL into a PPL because of the UMCI, user mode code integrity signing requirements I was just talking about. So instead, the attacker puts uh, the DLL on a storage device that they control. So, and then they sideload the DLL into a PPL. As the Windows loader attempts to load the DLL, their storage device will first return the original correctly signed Microsoft DLL for that code integrity check, that, uh, the, the green box in the middle, which is validating signature. After that point, the DLL will get mapped into the process by the memory manager and will start to be loaded. If you've ever written this you know, C or C++ DLL, you know, DLL main will execute, right? And at that point, the attacker is going to empty the system working set. And the system working set is the set uh, of all the pages that uh, the system, by emptying the system working set, they are basically forcing all of those pages that have just been brought in from my storage device as the attacker, and they're telling the memory manager, throw them away. It's okay, we'll get them later if we need them. And because these pages have not been modified uh, to the knowledge of the memory manager and the file system, they can be brought right back in the same way they were before. And so as uh, DLL main executes, uh, so the page faults are sent to the storage device of the attacker's control, uh, and the original DLL is then replaced with a payload, and the, it was, it's basically shellcode. And I was able to achieve arbitrary code execution as WinTCB Lite PPL using this. So in February of this year, uh, Microsoft added a check to mitigate this, and the general idea is that they are enforcing dynamic page hashes. Remember before I said page hashes are not enabled for PPL? Well, now they're sometimes enabled. So if you're using a network redirector, such as uh, Win SMB or Windows file sharing, then uh, page hashes will be, dynamic page hashes will be enabled. So what are the takeaways here? Well, we, we learned that we were able to successfully exploit bad assumptions that were made by code integrity in order to uh, achieve arbitrary code execution uh, as WinTCB Lite PPL. For reasons outside the scope of this talk, it was very easy using other not a security boundary bugs to uh, escalate to the kernel and achieve arbitrary uh, read writes of all physical memory. Uh, the, the mitigation that Microsoft applied was very narrow in scope. It was targeting only images loaded over network redirectors. So now we're gonna be talking about some new research and I, I wanted to know, could I exploit false immutability in other ways? Could I, for example, look at something that's uh, not an executable image section. Could I go on data sections, for example, or data files? Well, before we talked about Authenticode and we talked about how uh, the signature is embedded inside of the file during the signing process. And that's, that is true most of the time, but there's another way to sign a file and that is what's called a catalog signature. And a catalog signature is basically a form of detached signature so what it, what it turns out to be is uh, basically a long list of authentic hashes, the, same, the algorithm I was talking about before, just ha a whole bunch of hashes, and then a signature at the end. And the signature covers the hashes themselves. So the, the way this is, uh, when you have a catalog signature, any file with a hash in that list is treated as signed by that signer. So if we look on a sample Windows machine here, this one has 2,000 uh, catalog files. Each of these catalog files may have dozens or hundreds of authentic hashes in it. So how are catalogs parsed? Well, first, the file is opened with ZW open file. Next, the, they are, uh, a section is created, a data section. And then next, the section is mapped into kernel memory. And then the signature is validated and then uh, the catalog is then parsed, only if the signature validation step succeeds. So breaking this down, we can see there's some key insights. The first is that uh, the ZW uh, create file uh, uses file share read, but it does not allow file share write. And that means that they are denying write sharing and they are counting on this uh, lack of file sharing for uh, immutability of the file. And as I've already shown, this is a bad assumption. This is false file immutability. And the next thing I want to point out here is that this is ZW create section of sec commit 
And that is not sec image. Sec commit means it's a data file mapping or data file view. Uh, it is not a image section. So there's no concept of page hashes. So I wanted to know, can I do the same style of attack, but do it on a uh, security catalog instead of doing it on a uh, DLL? So the general flow of the attack is going to work like this. Uh, first, I'm going to install a catalog to a storage device that I control as an attacker. And then also as part of the catalog installation process, I create a symbolic link to the catalog, uh, to my storage device inside the Windows cat root directory, which is where all the catalogs reside. Next, I'm going to ask the kernel very politely to load an unsigned driver. Uh, it's going to look at that driver. It's going to look at its, uh, it's going to try to validate the signature on its own. That's going to fail because the, the driver is not correctly signed. Uh, next, it's going to try to uh, validate the signature via catalogs, and it's going to find that new catalog that I just installed. Uh, it's going to request the, the contents, the entire catalog, from my storage device, which is going to allow it to validate the signature. The first time on the first request, my, my storage device is going to return the original, correct, Microsoft-issued catalog. Once the signature validation is successful, I'm going to force flush the system working set, and that's going to cause all those pages that were just paged in to be discarded. So now all subsequent reads to that catalog are going to issue new I.O. requests to my storage device. So next, uh, once, once uh, Code Integrity gets to the parsing step, it's going to start requesting pages as it parses the catalog. And that's eventually going to uh, lead to a portion of the catalog that I have replaced one of those original authenta hashes with one of my own. The code integrity is going to ingest that, that authenta hash, and it's going to then uh, accept my driver as correctly signed, giving me arbitrary code execution in the kernel. So uh, when I did PPL fault, I was able to use an opportunistic lock, also called an op lock, at a specific point in the target process, the PPL's startup step, in order to pause it, basically. And, and I was able to basically stop time, which let me do some, some things I needed to do very you know, deterministically. And so it allowed the, the exploit to work like clockwork, and it was, it was very nice. I could not find a similar type of op lock opportunity here. So instead, I'm going for a probabilistic approach. And so I'm rapidly toggling the catalog on my storage device between benign, malicious, benign, malicious, benign, malicious. And I'm going to be using a brute force approach here. And also, I'm going to be choosing a hash that is near the end of the catalog because I assume that catalog parsing is linear. So I need to trigger a page, I need code integrity rather, to trigger a page fault between those validation steps I talked about before. I should be doing this validation step I talked about before, and then the parsing step. Uh, but the problem is the page is resident because it was just there for the validation. So I, how do I get that page fault to occur? Well, I need to empty the system working set between those two operations. And it's a very fast operation. So that it's a very tight race window. So I'm employing multiple approaches here to slow down code integrity in order to improve my chances of winning the race. Uh, one is I'm choosing a large security catalog. Uh, this one's four megabytes. Keep in mind, most security catalogs I saw were nine, 10 kilobytes. So four megs is pretty big for a security catalog. I have a thread that is dedicated to repeatedly emptying the working set. Remember, that's throwing out those pages to force them to be brought back in from my storage device. I have one thread that is repeatedly attempting to load the driver, load the driver, load the driver. And then I have a couple high priority dummy, dummy threads where I've raised the CPU priority on them. So they're actually executing with higher CPU priority than the system worker thread where that it, code integrity is using to load this driver. And the goal of this is to starve that thread of CPU cycles to slow it down as much as possible. So one failure mode of this exploit would be if the signature check fails. So if the malicious authenta hash is in place, when the, the validation step occurs, uh, code integrity is going to look at it, say that's not, an, that's not a correct signature, and fail out immediately. Another failure mode is if uh, the, code the, the signature check succeeds, but then an even number of swaps, because remember I'm swapping malicious benign, malicious benign, an even number of swaps occurs between the validation step and the parsing step. And even could even be zero depending on how much I've slowed down that code integrity thread. 
I win if I get code integrity to validate the benign signature and then parse and accept my payload signature, my payload authentic hash rather. Demo time, okay. So this, is, this part's interactive here. I could do a live demo, but it is a non-deterministic exploit. Or I can do a video. Look, live? All right, all right, we're, we're going live. Yeah, so here we go. Okay, so what I have here is, is a Windows 11 VM. I updated it last week, last Monday. Uh, as you can see, it's 23H2. It was up to date as of last Monday. Uh, right here, we have Windows Defender, MSMPENG. That's, uh, I think, a Microsoft Malware Protection Engine. Uh, and if we try to terminate it, even though we are administrator, we can't. Access is denied. And this is because, we can see right here, it is an anti-malware protected process. Uh, even admins can't kill protected processes. So I wrote a driver, which I'm calling payload driver, that attempts to uh, kill all the anti-malware protected processes on the system. So I have already registered as a service, so I'm gonna try to start it. And we can see here, Windows cannot validate the signature on this file. Well, let's go look at the signature on the file. So if we go to the signature on the file, we can see it is signed by WDK test cert. And last I checked, that is not Microsoft. So Microsoft, this is not a correctly signed driver. The Windows kernel will not accept it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to run my exploit. I named it in honor of MSRC because they said <laughs> administrator to kernel is not a security boundary. So it is not a security boundary. And here's where we sweat. Remember, this is a non-deterministic exploit. Uh, when testing it earlier today, I've had to run it between one and eight times. So we might be here a little while. No pressure. No pressure at all. All right. There we go. Okay, so thank you, thank you. So we can see the exploit here is, is printing output to the debug console. We can see it's killed MSMPENG. We also see it's not visible here in Process Explorer anymore. It's because it's killing it, and the service manager is trying to restart them, and they're just not coming back up. All right. I am so happy that worked on the first try. Chapter four, avoiding pitfalls. So in order to avoid this type of bug, we need to know a little bit more about it. So I'm gonna be talking now about a, a type of vulnerability that's kind of common if you're developing drivers, and this is called a double read. And a double read is, uh, can occur when you have two different processes that have access to the same page of memory, and the attacker is able to rapidly change that page of memory while the defender is, is using it. And simultaneously, the defender is reading a given value from that page multiple times. So to, just to motivate it with an example, on, right on, on, on the right here, you can see this struct IPC packet, and it has two fields. It has a length field and data field. So you can imagine you have some sort of client and server, and the client sends RPC requests or IPC requests to uh, the server, and the, the, the fundamental mechanism that the data is sent back and forth is with the memory mapping. So uh, in this scenario, the attacker sets packet length to 16, and then they do whatever it takes to signal that an IPC command has been sent. Now the IPC server wakes up, says, oh, I have a packet to process, and says, oh, it's, the length is 16, so I'm gonna allocate 16 bytes with malloc. Next, the attacker rapidly changes that length field from 16 to 32. And then while the server is still processing it, the next thing it does is try to copy that buffer into its own heap. And it does a mem copy, and it again references p packet length. But this time, p packet length is now 32. So it, it, it copies 32 bytes into a 16 byte buffer, and now we've overflowed the buffer. This is a significant consideration for, for kernel drivers as well as the kernel itself because they often operate directly on user mode memory, sometimes even with user mode uh, you know, uh, pointers, uh, virtual addresses. So as a call to action, 
I want to say that developers need to be treating attacker writable files as subject to double read vulnerabilities. Denying write sharing itself is not sufficient. So what does this affect? Well, a couple things. Uh, it affects image sections, and by that I mean processes, EXEs, as well as DLLs. Uh, if you call create process and you call load library and it's on a potentially attacker controlled file, then this is, you are potentially subject to this type of vulnerability. And you might say, well, that's stupid. Why would I ever call create process on an attacker controlled file, right? Or why would I ever call load library? Well, we'll get to that in a sec. Um, next would be data sections. So if you use map view of file or ZW map view of section, same thing, then uh, the steps you would need to avoid this would be you need to avoid double reads like I just described. Uh, alternatively, if you don't want to go and rewrite your code base and look for these types of vulnerabilities, you can just copy the entire file into a, into a new buffer, into a malloc buffer, or if you're a kernel driver, ex allocate pool, and work off of that instead. Uh, another way you could, you could do it if you it would be to, you, to lock those pages into memory using mm probe and lock pages or in user mode virtual lock, although I haven't tested the user mode virtual lock. Uh, and that would prevent the attacker's attempts to purge those pages out of memory. Uh, if you're using regular I.O., so before, to so this point, we've only been talking about memory mapped I.O., but this type of vulnerability applies to regular I.O. too. So if your code calls read file, and that's a lot of code, then you might be subject to this type of vulnerability. Uh, for, to, to, prevent, to protect against read file, uh, your best mitigations would be to avoid double reads. So, you know, read, seek back, read, don't do that. Uh, another uh, thing you could do is copy to the heap like I just described. What else could be vulnerable? Well, uh, I gen tend to look at the kernel because uh, I, that, that's, that's my interest. I'm an AV developer and I want to protect the kernel. Uh, so if we look at cross-references to ZW map view of section, here, this is, these are all in NTOS kernel. Uh, we can see a whole bunch of cross-references to it. And on the right, we can see cross-references to ZW read file. But there's a caveat here in that ZW read file is only vulnerable if it functions on file objects. And ZW read file may be used for more than file objects. There's a caveat to that caveat. And that is that a kernel code may actually end up getting tricked into opening a file when it thinks it's opening something else like a pipe. Uh, you can use, uh, there's all sorts of tricks you can do with object manager symbolic links to, to, to trick the kernel into doing things it's not designed to do. If we're looking outside of NTOS kernel, uh, we can see here a whole bunch of different drivers that are referencing ZW read file as well as ZW map view of section. So to this point, I've been talking mostly about kernel mode code, but I want to stress that this does not just apply to the kernel. This applies to any user mode application that calls read file, read file, map view of file, or load library on an attacker controllable file, assuming they are counting on the lack of write sharing denying uh, denying write sharing to make the file immutable while they're working on it. So a hypothetical example, uh, if you're using map view of file, say you have a program that's split into two components. You have a low privilege component that has network access and a high privilege uh, update service. And the low privilege component is responsible for downloading updates and then when it has an update downloaded, it puts it in a certain directory and then the, uh, the privilege service validates the signature. If the signature checks out, then uh, the, it installs the update. Well, that won't work because the, you could use false immutability. That lo the, the low privilege code uh, could exploit false immutability to forge that signature. signature. Uh, if you're looking at just read file exploitability, uh, you could cause uh, memory corruption in file parsers with these double read type vulnerabilities I just talked about. And examples might be an, a an antivirus engine or a uh, file indexer, so, or search indexer. Uh, if we're dealing with load library. So before we talked about, well, who would load a DLL that's signed by somebody else or is not signed? Well, the Windows kernel does, right? I mean, every, every time you're loading a driver, that's, that's often, it's only sometimes signed by Microsoft. So uh, the, the, the mitigation for that type of thing is to have some sort of signer enforcement. Uh, or if you're in user mode, you might apply the process signer mitigation, which says that all DLLs that are subsequently loaded into my process must be signed by Microsoft. Uh, and this, is, this will prevent uh, DLL injection uh, via various forms of uh, attacks that, I'm not gonna, that are out of scope of this talk. How do we, let's talk about mitigations now. 
So MSRC is not going to service admin to kernel, kernel vulnerabilities by default. As we said, uh, administrator to kernel is not a security boundary. And by service here, I mean fixed by security update. So as a third party AV dev, you know, I build EDR, I call it AV, but yeah. How, I can't fix code integrity. So what can I do to protect my customers today? And, what, and further, what can Microsoft do to stop this? Well, as a third party, to mitigate it's not a security boundary, I wrote another driver called fine, but we can still easily stop it. And fine, but we can still easily stop it is a file system mini filter driver that looks for these types of attacks, which is a, a catalog file being mapped into kernel memory. I'm not going to go through the details because I don't have time right now, but it's in the slides. Uh, and if it finds this particular pattern, it will then deny the action and it does stop. It's not a security boundary. Uh, but that's pretty messy. And it's probably, you could probably defeat it somehow. So compare that to the three-line fix in code integrity that I'm about to show you. So going back to the, the flow of how catalogs are parsed, if we just add two extra steps to the, the mapping, we can actually stop this. First, uh, after the file has been mapped into memory, if we just call exallocate pool, which is the same thing as malloc, it's kernel malloc, right? And then we copy the catalog to this new all newly allocated buffer. Now any attempts to, to mess and, and oh, sorry, and all subsequent operations are done off of that new copy. Now, any attempts to modify the file mapping, it doesn't matter, it's disconnected. Another thing you could do is you could call IO allocate MDL and MM probe and lock pages. And these will lock these pages of the file mapping into physical memory. So that way, an attacker who attempts to purge the system working set will fail. Uh, they, the rest of the working set will get purged out, but these particular pages will stay in physical memory. Another thing you can do as a, as a consumer is to enable hypervisor code integrity uh, because HVCI takes a different code path. The, 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 the catalog parsing code that I was showing you before is not actually active for it when HVCI is enabled. Instead, uh, code integrity sends uh, the, in, the bytes of the catalog over to the secure kernel, which runs in a different virtual machine on your host and the secure kernel copies it to its own heap and then does all the validation and parsing off of the, its own heap. And at that point, it has all the same benefits as copying it to be a malloc in your own process that I just talked about. So I disclosed this, uh, I disclosed both it's not a security boundary and fine, but we can still easily stop it to, micro, uh, to MSRC uh, on Valentine's Day, which is February 14th. And I suggested uh, two mitigations, the EX allocate pool, as well as the MM Probolog pages that I just showed you. Uh, about two weeks later, uh, the Windows Defender team reached out, uh, interested in coordinating disclosure. Um, last month, Microsoft released a uh, preview update for Windows 11 uh, with the MM Probe and Log pages fix. And then last Tuesday, uh, that fix reached GA. So thank you. Uh, So I just want to show you the old version of the code and the new version. So the old and busted implementation, which is I map and size data file, uh, we can see it calls uh, ZW create section and then ZW map view section. The new hotness version uh, does those, but then it calls IO allocate MDL and MM probe and lock pages. And this prevents those pages from getting purged out by the attacker. So in summary, Today, I talked about a, a new vulnerability class, which I'm calling false file immutability. Uh, I've motivated with two examples. Last year, I released uh, PPL fault at Black Hat Asia. Uh, that, that worked on, it was an admin to PPL to kernel exploit. Uh, that exploited false file immutability assumptions in image sections, specifically DLLs within protected processes of PPL. Uh, and then today, I'm releasing It's Not a Security Boundary, uh, which exploits false, uh, bad immutability assumptions in data sections. Uh, there, this is not the end of it. There are more bugs like this, and I look forward to talking about this in the future. So, thank you. Oh, I got booted. Okay, oh, here we go. So in conclusion, I'm gonna be releasing the POC uh, in late June. Uh, I'm giving the same talk at Recon, and I'm going to be releasing the POC exploit as well as the mitigation afterwards. Thank you very much.
Um, I want to give a special thank you to the Windows Defender team for collaborating and the, the disclosure and the fixes and for getting a fix out for a not a security boundary vulnerability in a very reasonable timeline. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm Gabriel Landau. I work at Elastic. And uh, if you want to know more about the release of the exploit, uh, that's going to be my, it'll be on my Twitter. So that's it. And thank you. Yeah.